This is Duke University. Uh, I want to welcome you and thank you for coming to this uh, talk that we're all so eagerly looking forward to. Um, it's an incredible honor to get to welcome back to Duke Leila Al Haddad. And uh, if I may just indulge in 30 seconds of nostalgia. So uh, I happened I to be, it, it'll be, it'll be lovely, I promise. <laughs> Um, I happened to be a graduate student at Duke when uh, Leila was uh, an undergraduate student here. And there are these stars that you get to meet where you're not really sure at the time where they're going to take life. Life doesn't take them anywhere. They sort of grab life by the horn and take it somewhere. Um, but you know immediately that you're in the presence of greatness. And that was very much my experience with Layla because it wasn't, and I would say this for many of you who are sitting here still trying to sort out, what are you going to do in your life when you grow up? Uh, it's not always so much uh, what you do, it's who you are. And it's investing in the content of your character. What um, Over the years, it's been an incredible honor to get to see Layla go from Duke to Harvard to working with Al Jazeera, where she was from 2003 to 2007, the Gaza correspondent, um, worked with BBC, with The Guardian, with Pacifica. Uh, and then she has also become a very well-known published author, um, publishing Gaza Mom and the Gaza Kitchen. Um, and I think what many of us have learned the most uh, from Layla is this extraordinary insight that she has that the most revealing scholarship and journalism does nothing to quote unquote humanize people. It actually takes as its starting point the fact that we are in the business of dealing with people who are already full life human beings. You can only humanize something that's not fully human. And so part of what Layla's project has been in moving from politics to history to kitchen to family life has been this way of conveying the full humanity of people who oftentimes are presented in a dehumanized way providing this extraordinary opportunity for us to ask questions about what is it about our lens and our perspective that um, prevents us from acknowledging that full vibrancy of, of humanity. So with that, if you would, please join me in welcoming back Duke's own Leila El Haddad. Thank you so much for that humbling introduction, which I do not deserve. I still haven't quite figured out what I'm going to do when I grow up. I don't think I've quite grown up, but in any case. Um, <laughs> Um, so, I co I mean, and I know this is part of, um, I guess, Ref Refugee Arab Refugee Awareness Weeks, and I'm going to try to frame it in that context, which it does belong to. But I'll, I'll start by saying, um, for those who don't know, I am myself a Palestinian, and I'm from Gaza City. I was born in Kuwait, and then I grew up, like many Palestinians at the time, in the, in the 1980s in the Gulf. So I grew up largely in Saudi Arabia while summering in Gaza and always uh, having retained a Gaza identity card, or Hawiya, which I still have. Uh, this document that's uh, issued and ultimately approved by Israel that determines who, which Arab is Palestinian, in other words, who, which of the indigenous inhabitants of the land actually has a right to inhabit their own land, return to their own land, live in their own land, and which isn't. And this system started uh, w uh, by the documentation or sort of, of the population registry in 1967, when Israel formally occupied the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And those Palestinians that were on the outside, for whatever reason, be they the way they were studying, for example, in Egypt, or they were just abroad working, they immediately got excluded from that population registry and uh, lost the right to return to their own land. So it's like the equivalent of you know, being in DC on a work trip, and then suddenly uh, you know, South Carolina like, takes over North Carolina and you know, just determines that you're not residents anymore. You know, but furthermore, you never have a right to even come back and visit North Carolina. It was like akin to that. So a lot of families got obviously uh, fragmented, and it was a you know continuation of a long-term process of fragmenting the Palestinian population um, and dispossessing them of their lands and their livelihoods. Um, so you know, I grew up. That that's my background. And then you know, I was able though to go back, whereas like my uncle who lived in Kuwait 
wasn't able to, whereas ultimately my husband, who, who I met in the United States when I came uh, to college and graduate school, um, can't. So he is a Palestinian from northern historic Palestine and grew up in a refugee camp in Lebanon. We met in Boston, um, but because he's from a different part of Palestine and is a registered uh, refugee with the UN, he de he's denied his what's known as the right of return. So he can't go back uh, to his historic homeland, um, nor can he go back to his wife's uh, place of residence, right? So Gaza. So, you know, there's a process by, it's a really complicated bureaucratic process by which Palestinians should be able to apply for family unification that the Israelis use as a tool of uh, political pressure and, you know, ultimately have, have ceased, have stopped. So it affects, you know, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who live like apart, uh, fractured lives, uh, violated and fragmented lives. So I just say that because I always get people asking in the end, like, wait, where are you from exactly? And why do you have an American accent? And where did you grow? What does this have to do with anything? So just so you have that as a background, that has informed my own take, you know, on the on the issue in my writings and in my in my interests and why I'm so focused, not just on cuisine in this particular project, but just generally on on elements that help locate us as Palestinians. So that's where this particular project comes in. My interest in in kind of code, not only codifying that this knowledge, um, you know, but but I think also being able to um, to narrate the Palestinian story through this very different lens and, and, and what we sort of refer to as a kind of ghost archaeology, map uh, the history of these lost, um, uh, you know, depopulated uh, and ethnically cleansed Palestinian towns and villages um, in 1948. And, and I'll talk about, you know, the focus of this is on a particular region of historic Palestine. But because of my own, you know, history as a, as a non-registered, I should say, refugee, because I was, you know, I'm ultimately able to go back, but one who's always grappled and, you know, negotiated different spaces and identities and what it means um, to be Palestinian and how you define your, where you locate yourself. Like, that's one of sort of, I think, a lot of Palestinians growing up in the 80s, first memories is like when you open an atlas or map, and you're like, wait, I don't exist. There's no, you know, there's no Palestine. Even my own son, who's now in fifth grade, but I remember in first grade, he came to me went home, like, really distressed and, He's like, I looked, I opened the atlas, and I couldn't find Palestine. You know, you, you said Palestine existed. Where is it? I can't find it, you know. So again, how do you grapple with all that? And, and cuisine is one way that you, that I think all um, diaspora communities, right, not just Palestinian, can, um, can identify and locate themselves where maps and dictionaries um, fail to do so. So when my co-author, Maggie Schmidt, approached me about um, her interest also in a project like this in 2009, I think it was, and we began, um, you know, planning for it, um, our in, the initial reactions we got from a lot of people when we kind of threw this idea around of writing a documentary cookbook that would weave together a traditional recipes and, you know, economic and political analysis and uh, vignettes of, you know, the current situation, the political situation, but also profiles of, of, of the people, right, specifically of women. Um, we, we largely received, it largely got reactions of sort of cognitive dissonance, like why would you subject Gaza to such a cruel irony and such a frivolous project. Like, why would you be writing about food amidst like war and you know impoverishment and and blockade? You know nobody really got it, and so it it was a struggle. Um, and it wasn't until we actually went to Gaza in 2010, and it took us a while, maybe a year or so, to successfully make it make it in. Um, you know, as many of you know, there's one main entry point into Gaza, and I'll I'll talk about it in a little bit that's frequently closed. And so it was closed for about a year, you know, in 2009, and there was a brief opening in 2010 in the aftermath of an attack on a humanitarian flotilla of ships that was attempting to enter. So, so we went there, and so whereas everybody else here just didn't get it, everybody in Gaza immediately understood that it was about so much more than food, and it was like people were just jumping all over us at the opportunity to be able to talk about their lives and their stories and their food and their history. It was incredible. They're like, wait, you know, you want to talk to us about something other than, you know, blockade and Hamas and rockets? And, you know, that all comes with, with the territory, right? It's, you know, we frequently talk about exploring these spaces where all of that exists, but as a backdrop um, to everyday life. And that's really what our focus um, was on is you know getting all that, but but using a different door or, or window, um, and and we talk about Gaza frequently being um, in addition to being besieged you know militarily, economically, politically, being besieged by journalists, um, and everybody's becoming so accustomed and having these rehearsed responses you know to a microphone being shoved in your face and being asked you know. Um, but, but you, you know, do you now support Hamas? Did you support Hamas before, you know? Um, but now after the war, has their support gone up or down or how, you know? 
Um, so anyway, that's just sort of as a, oh, I guess I can use this as a little introduction. Um, but you know, oops. Okay, so you know, uh, and, and sorry again if I'm being redundant or if some of you have been to other presentations, I'll try to be as original as possible. But you know, usually these are the kinds of images we're accustomed to seeing of Gaza, ones that are uh, anonymous and um, external and always subject to violence. And you know, I could show like obviously dozens of other pictures, but, but you get the idea, right? Of, um, you know, of like, you know, uh, dead babies and, and on and on and, and gray cinder block landscapes, which of course obviously is a very real, um, uh, and horrific part of the story, but but like Omid was saying, it, it's um, it's dehumanizing also, you know, and and oftentimes you know people mean well, right? To to be able to show this is really look at how bad it is, and people just feel like if they can scream it loud enough and show horrific enough pictures, it's going to do the situation justice and do the people justice. But it but it doesn't, and they, they'll be the first ones to tell you um, that that this isn't what the the kind of images they want to be portrayed about them. So that's why we talk about this project being also sort of. A, uh, something um, for the Palestinians in Gaza themselves to be able to have images of themselves that they recognize. Um, so what we kind of ask uh, rhetorically is, you know, uh, what would happen if you shifted the, the, the lens and you moved into any one of those anonymous windows and you came at it from like a different perspective? That work, okay. Or not. <laughs> um, and you went in, you know, onto the street level and, and even Further, what we wanted to do was explore these spa spaces that aren't typically represented, um, these intimate spaces that depict ordinary daily life, especially the life uh, of women. And this was a particular obsession of my co-author to document like kitchen windows. <laughs> but um, being an anthropologist, um, but you know, but it's true. Like, can we all sitting here, you know, imagine um, what these spaces look like and what um, Palestinians might cook with and what these. Um, these anonymous windows um, represent um, and look at this daily business of survival and, and really document and tell the story of the, the constant steadfastness and the struggle to stay human amidst these impossible circumstances. That was a real particular interest of mine is how do you narrate the story? How do you tell the story when it's, it's really become reduced to like a metaphor, right? You think Gaza, you think, oh yeah, got, you know, bombarded, besieged. Um, you know, just a horrible situation, uh, no food. You know, how do you get beyond that and tell the story in a, in a more real and humane way? Um, so, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, uh, our methodology really focused on this issue of, um, you know, number one, heritage documentation. Uh, because Gaza in its own right has a very, you know, for those who are interested in the, in the uh, food aspect, a very interesting, unique, and, and delicious, and largely unknown um, food. And that has to do with a lot of, Factors, one of them being that it's been, um, uh, you know, uh, geographically isolated for so long, besieged, um, uh, which has res resulted also in a gastronomic isolation. Um, but historically, Gaza was once the main port along the Mediterranean way back when. You know, we don't think of Gaza as being like a culturally rich, historically rich place, but it was the main port along the Mediterranean. Uh, formed like a, um, it was a depot, you know, for the, all the different caravans going to the spice routes. Uh, and so on, and um, a resting stop for those caravans. Uh, so it really was uh, a crossroads between continents, and it resulted in this very absorbing all these different influences from from the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, from Greece, from uh, from a little bit from uh, Northern Africa, and then um, the rest of the Middle East. Uh, so we were interested in heritage document documentation, uh, I should say, uh, and. Um, this is one particular aspect that's unique to Gaza is the clay pot uh, cookery and the use of this device called the zibdiya, which is a clay uh, uh, mortar and a lemon wood pestle that you see mortars being used everywhere, but this sort of ubiquitous and synonymous with Gaza where it's used to like pre prepare ingredients and cook in and serve the food in, uh, and of course is unavailable anywhere else because of the, the blockade. Um, and then we were also interested, like I was saying, in profiling individuals, home cooks, particularly women, uh, although as we learned, apparently southern and northern Gaza have uh, matriarchal societies, which even I, as a Palestinian from Gaza, did not realize that. And we, we sometimes tell a story of like visiting this, this incredible woman, Um Sultan, in, um, on a really, really hot, searing hot um, August day. It was Ramadan, 2010. And, um, you know, it was like 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And, it was about 3 p.m. that she had just fi finished harvesting or overseeing. She runs this up, you know, she has a little farm and she em employs like 30 people seasonally to harvest the chili peppers. 
And um, so she had finished that and was coming to show us how to make maftul, the Palestinian version of um, couscous. It's hand rolled. And, and so in my mind, and then I asked her, like, oh, where's your husband? And she's like, oh, he's resting, you know. So in my mind, I'm like, typical, the man gets to rest, and the poor woman just slaves away, like, from the morning, finishes the chili peppers, and is coming to show us maftul. And then I turn around, and there he is, like, cooking the stew for the maftul. And I'm like, wait, what's going on? And she's like, oh, I don't do the cooking. I just supervise. He does everything. She's like, oh, yeah, Um Sultan teaches me everything. And I was like blown away, besides the fact that he was cooking. I mean, that's not even so surprising. I later like would learn that she divided her land, you know, not, you know, which is traditional for the sons, but she had divided plots and built homes for all her daughters. And it was really interesting. And then I was speaking to a Palestinian anthropologist, later learned that Beni, the village of Beni Suhaila in southern Gaza and in northern parts of Beit Lahi in Gaza are matriarchal societies where this is very common. So, I mean, even that piece of knowledge like blew me away. I was like, wow. But, um, you know, just profiling, you know, and then again, you don't get this kind of information unless you are privy to these private um, domains and spaces. And, you know, wanting to get a sense of daily life as seen from the kitchen window, um, you know, it's because that's where families converge and and uh, stories get told, and uh, as I s have said before, where histories get perpetuated. Um, you know, the politics of the like, human humanization, micro-politics, um, that's where it all happens, the politics of the household economy and where you can learn so much that you, that you wouldn't learn um, otherwise. So these are all, you know, different women that we visited uh, throughout Gaza. Um, so we wanted, like I was saying, to tell the history of Gaza and then and I'll talk about, I, I frequently have talked about why specifically Gaza. You know, besides the fact that that's where I'm from, um, I think it's a very revealing um, in a sense that Gaza, by understanding Gaza, you can understand the Palestinian struggle as a whole. It's sort of what, what's referred to as an archive for the Palestinian condition. Uh, so wanting to tell that story in a fragmented sort of way. Uh, you know, and interviewing women across the spectrum, not just from Gaza City, but from southern Gaza, from the villages, from the, from the towns. And then finally, we have the element of the political and the economic situation as told through food, which understandably is a privileged point of departure, right? So it's not, we, I mean, we get that. Um, but it was something I think, you know, we understood that it was a way to be able to get other people to relate to the situation. But that's not, it's not like we sat down and like plotted and was like, how can we, what's the most effective strategic way to get, you know, as many people as possible to, to learn about the Palestinian situation. Um, it just happened to be like our interest and in something that we found very unique. I think um, you know, all Palestinians will tell you when you ask them like what's the most unique or like flavorful cuisine and they like, oh yeah, definitely in Gaza. That was definitely an element of it, but we thought it was, it happened to be at this nexus or this moment when the world seems obsessed with food, particularly in the US, so that did work to our advantage. But again, working from the smallest level, um, you know, from the household economy like I mentioned and going upwards, how does all this affect, you know, the ecology and the, you know, uh, how does the blockade affect agricultural policies, water? Um, we even get into the politics of humanitarian aid because what happens um, when you have a long-term uh, blockade as you do in Gaza is then you have long-term aid dependence and that's just a whole other part of the story where you have um, sort of 80% of the population now dependent on food aid where that, and this is a man-made situation, you know, it's not something, it's artificial, it shouldn't be the case and every, a uh, major humanitarian um, um, agency will tell, tell you as much in Gaza. This should not be happening. Nobody should have to rely on food aid. Gaza has, you know, Palestinian people in Gaza have never had to rely on food aid. It shouldn't be the case, but it's being perpetuated. It's being, it's, you know, this has been sown and created and made and perpetuated by, by world powers. So that's essentially what we were trying to do, weave together these three things. And using this kind of documentary style, where wanting to have things sort of in their natural setting, um, you know, the, what we call the photography of the mundane uh, and the material and the specific. Um, so now, you know, getting away sort of from the methodology and, and, and back to like why the focus on Gaza. And I talked about food mapping being a kind of ghost archaeology. Um, and then looking at Gaza as kind of a ca case study, um, even in, in other areas as like what we, you can look at it as a case study in postmodern colonialism. And, and um, because what, sort of what happens after the, Israeli disengagement in 2005 when Israel dismantled its settlements but retained control over Gaza's effective markers of sovereignty, its airspace and sea space, um, is that you, you, you can then look at it as this model of, okay, um, you know, Gaza was a problem but we still want to control it. How do you do that? It's like, so occupation or settler colonialism 2.0. Um, you no longer have to have your troops inside to control uh, an area. Um, you can be a little bit more strategic about it and then use also Gaza economically as a kind of dumping ground or a kitchen garden of sorts. So where you have excess produce, um, what do you do with that? You can dump it into Gaza and that's what happens. Um, where you have 
you know, that I, I talk about a specific um, uh, example where I went to a spice market in 2010, and there was like sackfuls of galangal gal root. Um, I mean, I, initially I didn't know what it was, and I recognized it, and I asked the guy, like, do you know what this is? And he goes, no, I, I have no idea. We just, the, you know, we ask for a certain, um, you know, order some X amount of spices, and everything has to be ordered through the Israelis. And, um, and then they brought this in, and we, we don't know what it is, but we've been using it in our soups. And so, you know, I tell him what it is. He's like, oh, I have, and then I researched later and discovered there was like a big Thai food craze in, in Israel that year. And I guess when it died down, they didn't know what to do with all the excess gallon gal, so they like, dumped it into the Gaza market. So again, you can see how this, all these different elements, um, sort of like a can of worms, you open it up and you begin to understand how everything is interrelated, how it's not just, you know, strictly about, you know, because people will frequently, well, why do they care so much about Gaza? Why is it, you know, or, you know, there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. You know, the, the first group of, uh, to actually um, protest during the most intense years of the blockade on Gaza were the Israeli farmers unions because they were being affected because they couldn't get rid of their excess produce and they couldn't, you know. Um, so there's more factors uh, at stake here um, than, than initially uh, it seems. Um, so back to sort of we were talking about the themes of displacement and dispossession and, and so forth. Um, the, um, the Palestinians in Gaza are actually largely, 80% of them are not from Gaza. They're actually from towns and villages um, surrounding historic uh, Gaza. So you can see here, the, well, the white line is the modern day Gaza Strip. And those borders were drawn in 1947 during the armistice agreement between the then um, Egyptian monarchy and Israel. Um, and what happened that year, and in the subsequent year, is you you had hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in the entire area of the, of the land of historic Palestine um, being um, attacked by Zionist militias uh, or else fleeing for safety and then being dis dis uh, dispossessed from their lands. Many of those villages, 415, were completely destroyed. And they often fled to the nearest cities or you know, congregated around wherever was closest to them. And in the case of Southwest Palestine, including Jaffa up there, they, you know, who came by sea, that was Gaza. So all of these people came to Gaza, tripling its population overnight. You know, Gaza was small, relatively population-wise. Um, and then the armistice agreement happens, and then these borders are drawn around them. And of course, that suited the, the settler colonial objectives um, of the nascent Israeli state. Um, even though they hadn't yet formali formally occupied Gaza, that would happen later. It went under Egyptian administrative rule, then it would be occupied. But these borders are drawn around them, and these Palestinians who are from this larger area that was known as the Gaza District, you know, there were no borders, um, obviously, during, in the entire area of the land, couldn't go back. So they were prevented from going back to their, their lands, and they've been there ever since. So that, you know, in addition to that element, that fact, it makes cuisine an interesting way to explore the history of a much broader area um, of Palestine from, that doesn't exist, I mean, this is an, obviously something that we had a cartographer drop, but, but an area that doesn't exist in modern day maps, but very much is alive and present in the collective consciousness and in the memories of people. And how do they keep that memory alive? Through the cuisine. I mean, that's one way, obviously. Um, so then you can explore this, again, like I was saying, through the food. But most of the Palestinians there aren't from, from Gaza. Um, th and that's important to keep in mind. Um, and just by way of perspective, now Gaza is about two, uh, two million, uh, I was going to say two million illa in, in Arabic, 1.8 million people. Um, and that's about half the size of New York City, like population-wise, and, um, or I'm sorry, that's, I think it's half the size of New York City by land mass, and then the same population density as Philadelphia. Um, so it's, it's very small, and we always, again, that's the one thing we always hear about Gaza, it's a tiny strip of land, but it's, nobody can really like sort of conceptualize what that means. Um, when we say that, that it's completely sealed off, closed off, um, so, you know, by, by sea, you have uh, a naval blockade that restricts the access of fishermen to three nautical miles, three to six nautical miles. By land, you have uh, this entire area surrounded by an electric fence and, and walls and sniper towers, and people can only get as close as like a thousand kilometers. Um, and this area in pink that you see is, is what's been designated by Israel as a buffer zone or a no-go zone. So that's where half of Gaza's arable farmland exists and is now inaccessible or destroyed. Um, and so that area keeps getting larger and larger. In fact, I think I might have another map you can, by comparison, you can see how it's grown. Um, like at one point I was doing a presentation and then I wanted to see if there was an updated map and I was shocked and I think it's actually gotten even further in after this last um, invasion in the summer. Um, 
so that restricts the access of farmers, and, and then you have the naval blockade. You have you know, drones buzzing overhead 24 hours. Um, its only airport was destroyed. And the only way in or out, and this is the, the part that people have a hard time conceptualizing, it's like, how do you get to Gaza? Um, would be the, you know, if you were a journalist or with a delegation that was allowed in by Israel, you would, you would fly into Israel and then drive to the area's border crossing. Um, and that probably applies to, I would say, 1% of the population who are given permits. But otherwise, the only way in or out is the Rafah crossing down there um, with Egypt, which has been open only five days this entire year and, and is usually closed for the, you know, I would say most of the years. And most of the time I was there, that was, you know, I would say half of count, having had to count the number of days when I was, I remember applying for my green card, I think it was like more than 50% um, of the time it was closed when I was trying to get in or out. But you would have to fly into Cairo and then drive five hours to the crossing and then wait to see if it's open or not. And that's assuming that Cairo allows you into Egypt in the first place. So you have literally at this moment 60 or 70,000 Palestinians on either side of the crossing waiting um, for the crossing to be open to resume their lives, right? To do the normal things that people want to do. They study or business trips or family visits or whatever. Um, and then you also have dozens and dozens of Palestinians who are in the waiting um, hall of the Egyptian airport and the detention facility that, that aren't allowed out until that border opens. So you can see a very closed off, a completely surveilled, and, and that's why it's no exaggeration. People refer to it as the largest open air prison, but a friend of mine um, who was a human rights consultant says that's not even correct because you know prisoners are afforded certain rights where in Gaza you're afforded none of those things. And he, he says it's more accurate to refer to it as a holding a, a facility or a pen you know, or something like that. Um, because in a, because it, it's in a place where it's, you know, the Palestinians there are kept with an eye to how the world sees them, to kind of tame them to, in, you know, into uh, subordination. Um, the, the question of freedom is never raised. That's not the issue. People are always talking about, well, do they have enough food? You know, are they being treated well? Um, we want to make sure the situation doesn't get out of hand. But nobody ever says, wait, do the fishermen actually have a right to fish? You know, um, do farmers have the, the freedom to to farm, can students you know, move about? Can they go pursue their educations? Um, that's really uh, the question that matters uh, to the people there right now. Um, you know, and this is just briefly talking about, uh, uh, and all of this kind of makes its way um, into the book, you know, speaking uh, to people, but we're talking about a very young population, uh, most of them under the age of 25, uh, most of them refugees, like I said, and then, um, you know, speaking specifically about how the, the blockade in its most current manifestation has impacted people, because that's something that also obviously uh, we get asked about a lot, um, is how do people, you know, manage under the blockade, or how are they able to cook the same kinds of foods they, they once cooked, or, you know, how are they coping? Um, and that was, I, I would say, the, what we found the most interesting is, um, you know, people do, do what they have to do, right? They have to survive and, and adapt. But, um, um, we do like to point out that it was, it's a continuation. The blockade in Gaza, we, we usually think about it as being as a direct response or reaction to the election of Hamas in 2006, or else, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the battle between Hamas and Fatah and then their subsequent takeover of Gaza. You know, that's, what, that's the starting point, right, that we usually think of. But in reality, it's a continuation of a long-term closure policy that's been enforced on Gaza ever since the early 1990s when uh, the Oslo Accords were implemented and a permit system was put in place by the Israelis that would then um, uh, make Palestinians you know, apply in order to leave Gaza and, and enter into Israel and ultimately the West Bank. And that's just gotten tighter and tighter and tighter over the years and to the most um, current form that we see. Uh, and again, the, the message we kept hearing from people was, you know, this isn't about food. It's, and, it's, uh, and in fact, food, you know, is available. Um, it's just not accessible. So, you know, and what that means, and this is something we learned, like, in our research, is that that particular year, 2010, we, we saw a lot of people, you know, writing articles and saying, like, you know, what is everyone complaining about? There's Snickers and sodas and chips on the sh supermarket shelves of Gaza. Like, why are they talking about everybody being hungry? What's the big deal? Um, and again, you can take this argument, by the way, and you know, talk about any sort of impoverished neighborhood in the United States or around the world, you know, and, um, and you know, obviously it's an argument of ignorance implying that you know, the availability of ingredients um, somehow excludes hardship. But, but the point being, yes, these things might be available. And at that time, if they weren't coming in through the tunnel network, this vast network of um, tunnels that uh, were uh, created in direct response to the, uh, the siege, which now have been almost completely destroyed by Egypt, if they weren't coming in through the tunnels, they were you know, somehow coming in either through the, 
the, uh, the trucks, the, the, the aid that was coming in through limited means. But the point is, because of a situation that has created long-term aid dependence uh, and impoverished most of the population, they're just not affordable to people. Um, and, and that's a really uh, critical distinction, because I talked about before the figure re being really alarming, something like 44% of the population now unemployed, but 80% reliant on food aid in order to feed their families. Like, without that food aid, they wouldn't be able to feed their families at all. And again, that's a man-made situation that just shouldn't, shouldn't be the case. And, and then, again, this is because of a blockade whose very specific objectives we learned. And again, it was that year that the Netanyahu government um, talked about the blockade's goals uh, being specifically to stifle productivity uh, and development while, you know, preventing an all-out humanitarian crisis. And I think the exact words of his advisor at the time were, we don't want to put Palestinians on a diet, or we don't want to starve Palestinians, we just want to put them on a diet. And in line with that, they came up with a caloric formula where they allow in just enough foods and so to be able to say, look, you know, everyone in Gaza should be covered, so there's no complaining, you know. You have gotten enough for 1,300 calories for, for you and your family. And um, in other words, the, the point is, again, like think of Palestinians as animals, just enough to feed them, maintain them, and, you know, be subordinate and, you know, acquiescent. But don't talk about your, you know, desire to uh, learn or to farm or to fish or, or whatever or to move about freely. Um, and um, this is just a depiction of, uh, you know, a lot of these great uh, graphic uh, designers in Gaza created these different depictions following last year's assault to try to convey, like, what the reality of Gaza was. But, um, and so the way that this, these, what, what are referred to as the tenets of the siege play out, as we learned, is by, by targeting the, the productive economy. Um, so what that means is, uh, in essence, you know, how do you accomplish that? It's not by, like, just starving everyone. That won't... Um, you know, accomplish your, your goals as an Israeli government, it's to, you know, uh, destroy the agricultural sector. If it's in the middle of a, an attack or one of their, you know, operations, like last year or a 25% of the targets were, were either farms, uh, you know, dairy, uh, uh, what were they, dairy pens or something, I guess, chicken pens and dairy farms and things like that. Um, and then olive groves, uh, I mean, the numbers are astounding when you see how many, I think it's like 20,000 trees or something, uh, agricultural um, colleges, and on and on and on. These, all these sorts of facilities were completely decimated in Castlet, and then again last summer. Um, you know, and, and beyond the, the agricultural sector, uh, you, you see factories having been particularly hard hit. After Castlet, 95% of factories were either you know, out of operation or destroyed. Um, this is a picture of the buffer zone in the, the furthest north part of Gaza. Um, here you can see the Israeli side and the Palestinian side that's been completely cleared uh, of all its farmland. <clears throat> and this is just a, you know, along the beach here. Um, one of the only uh, outlets or escapes, I would say, for Palestinians there. Um, and um, you know, this is sort of a typical market in Gaza. But so yeah, so you see the things. These would be typical vegetables that were, are grown locally in Gaza that you can't export because there's almost a complete ban on exports. Now, some things have, you know, with the uh, sort of lobbying of foreign governments like the Dutch who really wanted their carnations and their strawberries out of season, <laughs> um, were able to manage to get some of those um, products out of Gaza. But, but otherwise, most products are grown and then sold locally at incredibly cheap prices, um, similar to, you know, areas that are um, sanctioned around the world, um, dumped on the local market. Um, whereas before, tomatoes would be exported to the West Bank and to other parts of Palestine. Um, that's not the case uh, now. So it impacts the accessibility of goods uh, in the market, obviously. But, you know, while I, I'm mentioning strawberries, you know, I, again, you, you sort of digress and you learn um, new things all the time. And it seems like intuitive and like, yeah, that's a really great thing. If you can grow strawberries as a Palestinian farmer in northern Gaza where they grow really well, um, and out of season, and you can export them. You know, of course, it, everything is contingent upon Israeli approval. So you can only export them if Israel opens the commercial crossings. And as a farmer, you're offered no guarantee six months in advance. You know, you're not told like, hey, heads up, in six months we're going to close the border indefinitely. So that happened in 2005, following the Israeli disengagement, before Hamas were elected. Right after the Israeli disengagement, Israel unilaterally closed the commercial crossings for three or four months, and it devastated that particular sector of the. Uh, of the agricultural, uh, um, of the farming uh, industry. So the strawberry farmers lost like $50 million. Um, but beyond that, 
The problem is strawberry farming is extremely water intensive and, and it wasn't something that was um, native to the area until in the late 1980s um, the, when, when Israel was still also in charge of the civil administration of Gaza. It convinced the farmers and said, you know, we can offer you some really nice subsidies if you stop growing citrus and instead grow strawberries. Um, and so it did that, and then they switched to strawberry farming, which is, you know, depleted the water resources in an area that the UN has said will be without water in, I don't know, X number of years. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, already uh, the water aquifer there is extremely saline. So it did that, convinced them to go to the strawberries, and when it disengaged, again, without coordination or communication, um, left these farmers to kind of fend for themselves. Um, and it's this sort of shattering, um, you know, psychological reality of uncertainty, of never knowing when the border will be open, whether, what you should grow, um, how you should think about, you know, what to grow as a farmer, specifically for the next year. And when we were there in 2010, we, we found a lot of farmers grappling with this issue of, you know, what do we, do we um, switch, you know, because also pesticides and fertilizers are imported. So um, we had a lot of farmers in order to get a boost, an early boost in their crops over fertilizing because uh, they weren't sure if they would be allowed, you know, uh, if more fertilizer would be allowed in. And then the result was like hundreds of cases of like watermelon poisoning or tomato poisoning. And then um, it, was, it was really interesting. And then a switch as a result to traditional methods of farming and then organic agriculture. And this massive 10-year agricultural plan was drawn up by the government um, to try to convince farmers to uh, plant rain-fed crops instead of ones that are dependent on imported fertilizers, instead of cash cropping. Um, and so we found that to be um, really interesting as well. And I'll um, maybe show you some pictures of that. Something else we saw was um, like pilot uh, mushroom farms were being created to supplement, give some supplemental um, vegetable protein to people. Um, <clears throat> and these are just ubiquitous. You know, everywhere you go, you see these, you know, the food aid packages and, and frequently you'll have people kind of noting, um, you know, the irony of like an entire field that has been raised with like caterpillar um, bulldozers and then having, um, you know, these USAID, or you'll, or you'll have a sign that says, you know, um, this farm is being rebuilt by the American people, you know, the same people that like destroyed the farm. So, um, but, yeah, you frequently see that. And in fact, even the UN, you know, speaking to the head of um, operation, field operations of the United Nations there at the time, you know, even he was noting like it's just he's like, you know, well, how we can't get the Americans to understand that it's like, you know, with one hand they're choking the the Palestinian economy, and they're choking, they're killing the Palestinian people, and with, with the other hand they're like feeding them. It's like, you know, why spend all these tax dollars? Um, so it's frustrating, I think, even for the, um, the NGO sector there. Um, so this is an example of a farmer that's grappling with the situation I was telling you about. Extremely jovial man, and we, we really struggled to, talk, to depict, you know, without using the same words and references over and over, the spirit of the farmers that we saw there. You know, all of them have been subject to some um, really cruel fate, whether it, you know, in this particular case, Mohammed Sultan, um, you know, he had like 500 acres of land, um, of you know, fruitful olives and, and citrus groves and every fruit you can imagine and 50 beehives and was doing really well. Just all of it completely destroyed. And nobody comes and says, you know, hey, we're gonna compensate you. Um, just like that. And, um, and he was at a farmer's uh, union's workshop trying to you know, um, learn you know, how he could move forward, what he should do, whether he should resort to um, you know, horticulture, whether he, which is you know, pesticide um, heavy and, and dependent again on the um, imports of certain Things, whether he should plant, um, replant his trees, which it would take anywhere from seven to 10 years to become productive and fruitful again, um, or whether he should switch to like strawberry farming or something. And in the end, he decided to replant his trees, but in the meantime, was gonna have to face the fact that he would be dependent on food aid like everybody else. Um, but he was happily posing with his calabash squashes for us and you know, showing us, um, explaining the story of the land. And um, we met so many people like this that, um, you know, uh, one, on one of our first days there, um, we had, we were discussing amongst ourselves how to obtain this like traditional recipe for lentils and pumpkin, and we didn't know who knew it, or lentils and okra. And then we, we were in my mom's clinic, and we, suddenly this doctor like popped his head out and was like, did you say okra and lentils? That's my favorite dish. Let me tell you how to, you know, and let me tell you about like Ottoman land law in Northern Gaza, and let me, and then everybody starts congregates around and wants to offer their own recipes. And, you know, it turns out like almost everyone is an amateur historian. And it's, I mean, it was incredible. And we got so much information from people who are so passionate to really be able to tell um, these stories um, that weren't being told. Um, so, so in the end, we think of it as a story of survival and, again, a struggle to stay human despite these impossible situations. And
how were people were coping and despite these odds um you know i talked about the tunnel trade that really was related to the long-term restrictions imposed by israel on the movement of both people and goods because we think of a blockade as blockading the import and export of goods but it's also on the movement of people um, and there, you know, they were at some point they were large enough to be able to, you know, and, you know, just walk through. Um, and you frequently had cases of Palestinians who were married, who one person had a Hawiya and ID, the other didn't, uh, bringing in their spouses through these tunnels. Um, but bringing in everything from livestock during the um, holidays to entire cars to computers, and it got to the point where you, it was no longer a black market. It was like an institutionalized, um, regulated tax part of the economy. And um, you know, any, you could put it in order, like say as a student you need a new laptop, you put it in order and th this person on this side contacts the Egyptian contact and gets it from Cairo or from wherever and brings it to you. Um, and so really e everything, and, and you know, um, I was uh, speaking with my, one of my other uh, collaborators in Gaza, a professor there in one of the universities in uh, class yesterday, and he was like, you know, noting how you know, the irony is that, like, Israel is always lamenting the existence of these tunnels, and we want to destroy the tunnels, and that's why protective edge, and that's why this, and, um, but the reality is these tunnels really were, like, happened and flourished in direct response to the imposition of the Israeli blockade. They didn't exist before. I mean, I directed a film called Tunnel Trade in 2007, um, and at the time, the tunnels, it was like a handful of tunnels, and they were mainly used for, like, some contraband or whatever, you know, like, you know, um, marijuana or whatever, nothing. But, I mean, they really flourished. Like, they became a multi-million dollar enterprise after the, the siege took full force. Um, and, you know, several Israeli human rights organizations have pointed the same thing out um, over and over. This is a, a women's cooperative in Gaza City that uh, there's 14 or 15 of these women come and uh, you know, cook there for uh, either catering or other purposes and support their families. Uh, another, um, uh, another dimension of the, the uh, impact of the blockade is that women have largely become the breadwinners in their families, where now there are more women employed in Gaza than, than there are men. And in this case, like Lourdes Samouni um, supports 14 or 15 members of her family and her brother's family. Uh, and this same family was the one that very tragically lost like 50 members um, of their family in one blow in Operation Cast Lead in a really infamous incident. Um, uh, in 2007, these two er, brothers, or 2010, I should say, started Gaza's first freshwater fish farm. Um, and again, it's like, why would you, you know, want, it's uh, all this politics of the absurd, why would you need a f fish farm in a coastal territory? Um, because, you know, the fishermen can only fish three nautical miles into sea. And it's only when you get to nine nautical miles that you uh, hit this deep sea channel where the larger fish, the migratory species are going to come in from the neighboring countries or neighboring, um, you know, waters. So with that limited access, you're catching mainly like fish about this big. I remember the last time I went there when I was showing Anthony Bourdain around, everything we saw was about this big. I mean, it was really sad. So as a result, this happened. And then the NGO sector, of course, adopted this model. And you see these now all over Gaza. And they provide, you know, a supplemental cheap source of protein, uh, mainly tilapia, and so forth. But it's, you know, you ask the people there, and they're like, for thousands of years, they've been consuming wild Mediterranean species of fish, and now they're, you know, relegated to this. But that's, that's the reality. Um, I talked about this move towards organic and sustainable agriculture, where most of the land that, um, what are referred to there as the liberated lands, the lands that where the, uh, the settlements used to occupy, um, have now been planted with, like, millions of these um, uh, date palms and... Um, and olive groves and so forth that rely on, on rain versus um, you know, fertilization and so on. Um, there's these massive composting facilities and uh, oyster mushroom farms that are, um, again, you know, just trying to think sort of in the long term, assuming that Gaza will be blockaded and besieged, how can we respond locally? And even with this, there's like, you know, tons of debates raging locally. It's not like, God, I mean, I, I guess the takeaway here is Gaza's a polity with a lot of debates raging, a lot of opinions, you know? Um, it's not as simple as like Hamas, Fatih, rockets, tunnels, whatever. I mean, even on the issues of, you know, um, you know, agricultural sustainability, you have people being like, no, we must be part of the global economy. And others saying, no, that's just not practical. How do we respond? And, you know, this is a crazy idea. This isn't. Uh, and people were really passionate about this. I mean, uh, we were, you know, ourselves just totally blown away. Um, you, maybe I'll stop and we can do questions, because otherwise I'll just keep going and going and going. <laughs> and no one is stopping, so stop me, please. Did you take your own questions? Yeah, yeah that's fine, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm just 
don't. Um, I know. I can, you know, yeah, maybe if someone asks me something, I can take a different direction. I'm trying to think in my mind what, um, you know, I didn't really talk so much about the food per se. I can talk about that, but, um, oh, does someone have, oh, yeah. Hi, thanks so much for coming. I just, uh, I have a slightly different question. I'm writing a paper right now on Palestinian cuisine in general and how it's mm -hmm. perceived internationally. Mm -hmm. And something that I noticed was that whereas you get like Egyptian restaurants, Turkish restaurants, mm -hmm like Palestinian owned restaurants tend to be kind of Mediterranean or just Arab food generally. Yeah. And do you think that that's like a conscious deci decision made by Palestinian communities in like the US or the EU? Or mm -hmm. um, do you think that Palestinians view their culture as more general rather than specific? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And that's something that really irritates me too. But I think that actually is more broadly, somebody was once telling me you can trace the you know, geopolitically, like U.S. conflicts with certain countries or regions to, you know, the um, uh, different restaurants that pop up in different communities and, and refugee flows. And, um, you know, whether it's like Syria, Iraq, whatever. And, um, and I think generally, if you're open to restaurant for the purpose of making money, you try to just be, I mean, this is the thinking, at least speaking to different restaurateurs, you know, th their idea, it's a, it's a, you know, model based on like, how can we make the most money without pissing off, you know, the most people without just being completely um, apolitical. And I think that's what they think it is, is just, you know, marketing it under this sort of um, ambiguous, like Mediterranean brand of, you know, who catch all, who knows what. I, like, I remember seeing a place that ended up being an Iraqi restaurant, but it was in Laurel, Maryland, that was like, you know, um, South Asian, uh, Middle Eastern, kebabs, you know, whatever, curry, everything, just everything, you know, whatever, whatever might appeal to brown people is here, you know, so, like, you know, but, um, and I, then I saw the woman making, like, Iraqi bread in the back, I was like, wait, that looks amazing, are you selling that? And she's like, oh, no, no, this is, why would you want that, go to eat, and I was like, no, but this looks really good, you know, he's like, who'd want to eat this? I'm like, I would, I would, you know, <laughs> but, you know, so I think that's what the thinking is, and then um, maybe when you have more um, seasoned chefs or whatever, or th then they begin to, so I don't think it's like a conscious decision of, you know, I don't want to identify myself as Palestinian. It's just like, I want to make money, you know, or I, I mean, um, but I think you're beginning to see, you, you do, but you're right, it's, there's pockets in New York and, you know, in Brooklyn and um, in heavily Palestinian areas, you know, you'll see it in Patterson, New Jersey. Um, I'm trying to think where else in, um, you know, in Washington, there's a couple, but definitely they're not as, as prominent, you know, and I think that's what it is. They just wanted to appeal to as many people as they could and, but I suspect that's, you know, changing probably, slowly, yeah. Who's been the audience? Yeah. yeah, it's really arranged. I've been, I mean, we were really surprised because like I said, we, we struggled in the beginning to find, you know, a publisher that would accept this because it sort of fell through the cracks of traditional, you know, it wasn't quite a cookbook and it, you know, the mainstream like cookbook publishers were like, we just want food. Um, and the sort of like left-wing independent publishers were like, we just want politics, like, but what is this, you know? So, um, so we struggled and then when, it, when I think people finally saw it and then they're like, they got it, it really seemed to appeal. You had like sort of the foodie element that weren't interested in politics at all, but they got it anyway. And uh, you know, we've had people be like, oh, it's such a great book, if only she didn't poison it with her politics or like reviews like that. But then, you know, we've also, to my surprise, I've had a, a, a lot of like really hardcore like pro-Israel contingent um, James Beard Award winners that have somehow, you know, gotten to the book and, you know, um, written, including like um, Roseanne Gold, um, who, you know, um, I met in New York and she was just like blown away and she was like, I, and she even said to me like, look, I would have never considered reading anything from sort of this perspective or, you know, or about the Palestinian narrative. I was always just like hardcore Israel, Israel. But I'm so sure I never knew anything about Gaza or Palestine or now I'm reading this and I can't put it down. And she wrote this really like lovely review in the Huffington Post. And so I, and I, we've met a lot of people like that. And that wasn't our intention, honestly. I mean, we just wanted to do this. We didn't want to like water it down. We really were doing this, like I was saying, for, first and foremost for sort of as a codifying this knowledge for the Palestinians and also providing a way to tell the story for others. But it's really reached everything. So the foodie contingent and the, the political people who are interested, solidarity folks and you know, Palestinians themselves, um, also who are in diaspora, English speaking Palestinians who have wanted these recipes and haven't had them. So I think it's just reached a very broad audience, which has encouraged me. And I'm now working with two other Palestinian anthropologists on like an all pal mapping sort of all of Palestine through food. So that's a bit of a longer project, but yeah. Sure. Uh, Layla. Oh, where? I, I hear a voice, but I don't see where it's coming from. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, I'm Israeli, 
and I came here before high school. Next year, I'll be going back to Israel for grad school. Mm. So I was just wondering what, what can I do to help? When you go back or when you're here? When I go back. You know, it's so hard. I mean, it's a whole different dimension, obviously. But I, you know, even a lot of my really close Israeli friends who feel so completely paralyzed right now because of the politics, you know, within Israel itself um, are so polarized and so extreme and so right wing that they feel like they're, you know, um, everything they're saying is falling on deaf ears. But, you know, um, it's, I, I, sometimes I say it's as simple as, you know, starting a conversation with someone or just, you know, um, introducing them to something, you know, even if it's not something like this, but you know what I mean? Something that's like sort of not benign, but you, you know, you get my picture or just trying in any way you can to, to humanize. But, you know, in, in the Islamic faith, we talk about there being like levels of action and then the, the, the weakest, but still like, you know, um, a level of action is, you know, f in wanting to change a situation in your heart. Um, you know, and if you can't, ch you know, change it with your hands, and ch if you can't do that, change it, you know, with your speech, and if you can't, then at least wanting to change it, having the intention to change it in your heart. Um, and so I always say, like, you know, at least do that, you know what I mean? Have that intention. And then, and I sometimes tell people who just, you know, for whatever reason they can't, I'm like, you know what, just start a conversation with someone, wear a conversation starter and see what you can do. But, you know, obviously that's a whole different realm, but, you know, a, it's something that I think the Israelis have to decide for themselves. What is the future they see for their country? You know, um, you know, where do you see this going? And do you see a, you know, do you foresee a, a future where we're all living together, or one that it's going to just, you know, continuously creep towards, you know, um, discrimination and, and apartheid and so forth? And you know, my hope is not because event, you know, that's just not sustainable. So I think you know you're on the in the right path, just to having that intention and wanting, you know, to make a difference and. Um, I mean, you never know. It's sometimes there's small little projects that you can do that can really um, change that, I think. But Thank you. I don't know. We can talk more. <laughs> um, has the blockade actually changed what would be considered traditional uh, Palestinian or Gazan foods, um, depending on what's available? Yeah, yeah, I forgot to talk about that. Um, for sure, in fact, I didn't really get so much into the, the food part. I'm trying to see if I have anything um, <coughs> relevant here on that. But um, like, um, sorry, I just put in free stuff, but. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's impacted, um, it hasn't impacted like the recipes in the sense that people are still continuing to make the same recipes they always did, but it's impacted the ingredients that are available. So, and if, I mean, to someone who like leaves and goes back, it's really like dramatic, I think. Just in the course of five years, people have almost completely eliminated olive oil from their diet. Um, you know, whereas obviously that's a staple of the Palestinian diet. Um, it's just so prohibitively expensive right now that unless you are part of the, you know, um, uh, you know there's a segment of, you know, um, uh, elite there or have family wealth or whatever, like maybe five, ten percent of the population have orchards and things like that, or you're gifted a bottle or something, um, nobody can buy it. It's certainly not rationed out. Um, you know, like I was saying, 80 percent of people get aid rations, and that's soy oil or, or mainly soy oil, yeah. Um, and so they would only use olive oil like sparingly for drizzling, you know, definitely not for cooking. So that's, I think, the biggest difference that I've seen. Um, People don't use more expensive, you know, grains or products like semolina or frica, you know, roasted um, green wheat anymore. They'll just use, again, what's rationed out, white flour, white rice, um, even dairy, like, you know, um, UN ration, powdered milk to make cheeses and things like that. So that's really been the, everything has turned white, you know. <laughs> um, so, you know, and again, people have, you know, I think, I'm trying to think what else, um, a lot of processed things that make their way in, again, previously through the tunnels, but again, um, just everything, you know, fortified biscuits and things like that. And, you know, because um, people even, you know, um, and again, I sometimes talk about you not being able to assess this unless you kind of look in a bowl. And then you can see, well, someone is making like, like a, you know, um, you know, a mallow stew of like a greens. It's very traditional in that area, but they're making it with chicken wings, you know, instead of a whole chicken. Um, or um, they're not using uh, fresh meat, they're using a frozen smuggled meat. Um, you know, you never find fresh meat anymore. It's just, you know, because so many of the, um, like I was saying, the, uh, the, the livestock has been killed, 
Um, it's just not available. It's not enough to feed everyone. And it's so expensive if, you, if it is available. So you have to buy like frozen meat at a fraction of the price. Um, and who knows what. And then fishing is another interesting thing that, you know, far, um, fishermen actually will meet their Egyptian counterparts at sea, like if they can get away with it at the border, see them, and then buy fish from them and then sell it in the Gaza market. So you go to the, fi the fisherman's market and they'll be like, yes, this is Egyptian, this is tunnels, this is pre-frozen, you know, and then like these little things are from here. So that's, you know, so that's how you can tell. Um, or you'll have the dented products that were, you know, imported through the tunnels versus, you know, at a fraction of the price versus... So that's really, I think, the biggest difference. And then access to fresh fruits, fresh fruits, vegetables, and products. Um, uh, it's just people just can't buy. And there's some NGOs trying to supplement by giving like vouchers where you can purchase stuff like this, but it's just not enough for, for large families. Um, so you're finding fre frequently people don't have access to like the fruits they once did or can't, you know, can't buy them, can't purchase them. So they may be available, but they're just not affordable. Yeah. Actually, something brings up some a thought. Um, there was, it, it reminds me of, um, the, the change in statements, the change in basic statements. Right, exactly. Um, yeah. when Ethiopians, Ethiopians were moving from, from Ethiopia to Israel. Mm -hmm. One of the major issues was so facing tech flour, white flour, okay, which is exactly. extraordinarily high in, in right, nutritious. Right. And it's actually caused significant yeah. malnutrition in the Ethiopian population. Okay, so that's so interesting, yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if there's been any work done on the switch in staples uh, to yeah. the question staples causing yeah. malnutrition, being a right. contributed factor to malnutrition. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that there's a specific study, but there's definitely studies on, on malnutrition and in the siege of malnutrition because we, and I think we talk about it in the book, but we spoke to um, an organization called the Ard um, al-Insan, the um, People's Earth, or, and their focus is malnutrition, specifically in children. And, and you can trace, you know, the rates of anemia, um, iron deficiency, anemia, and malnutrition exactly to the onset of the siege and blockade. And it has specifically to do with this access, according to the nutritionist, access to fresh fruits and um, vegetables and meats and things like this. Um, you, know, uh, you know, yes, like lentils are rationed, chickpeas, but I mean, you know, in the end, how, how will that fit into a comprehensive uh, traditional diet, like you were saying, where you're supplementing all these traditional things? So yeah, absolutely, I think. You see that, and then you see a lot of stunted growth, and you see, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, um, affects cognitive development and, and all this other stuff. Yeah. I, I was gonna ask you a question about what, what, what did you think about, what do you think about the um, Israeli appropriation of Palestinian cuisine in, in, in mm. Israeli restaurants? Yeah. Um, I, I was in, um, when I was in um, Jerusalem, living in Jerusalem, when I went to a restaurant with a friend and we were eating maklobe and, and she, in a, an Israeli restaurant and she yeah. was rage about, yeah. was raging about like this sort of appropriation or fetishization right. of Palestinian cuisine in like, you know, the middle of the heart of like, you know, occupation. Yeah. And just related note, Whole Foods has two kinds of couscous. Um, French couscous and Israeli couscous. Okay, right? really? Because no, carried, I heard. Oh, no, it was yeah. Willi Williams in Sonoma carried Canaan Palestinian fair trade couscous. I don't know if they still do, but um, you're finding it more readily available. And I think one of the good things I would say that happened, you know, as a result of this, is you have more magazines like Bon Appetit, Savour magazine did a big um, issue on Palestine, um, beginning to introduce these products. And there's becoming a more nuanced awareness, I think, about this, whereas it just wasn't on people's radars before. But I, feel, I get asked this so often, and I feel like I've become like the go-to now. Whereas, it, you know, so just to, but no, it's good, you know. And and what I and it's good because it's now it's on people's radars. Like people are beginning to say, wait, you know, um, and and usually both. If Maggie were here, you know, we, we what we both say is like, look, it's no one is saying that you can definitively like copyright or patent something and be like, you know, or that you can never enjoy like, you know, sushi, you know, or hummus or whatever. But you know. It, what, what's happening, like you were saying, is this is a far different cry to completely appropriate it and, and then say, you know, and this is Israeli and it's always been Israeli. And that, you know, implies then that, you know, and we don't recognize Palestinians, nor, we, nor are we sort of acknowledging the underlying, you know, um, context of all of this, you know, that we like took the land. And then we're also, so we talk about it, food as being another frontier to colonize um, in that sense. And, um, you know, without acknowledging that, you can't really move forward. Um, but, you know, uh, and so, and we, I talked about this, we, there was a big interview between Yotama Otolenghi and us on this, on this issue in Bon Appetit, where we talked about this very thing. And, you know, to his credit, he's very, like, he's, he's out, you know, because he's a celebrity chef, he, he's always saying, like, no, no, we need to acknowledge, and he does what he can to get Palestinian product, and, and, um, and I think that's the direction chefs need to, to go in. Um, but, yeah, it is very problematic, and, um, and what we always tell people is, you know, 
it's not as, it's what we talk about as, you know, it's not as simple as like, I love hummus, you love hummus, why can't we all get along? This concept of like hummus kumbaya, you know? Um, so it's like, yeah, sure, we can get along if you don't like steal my land and if you acknowledge my rights, you know, then, you know, but we can't just have hummus and then continue with settler colonialism and Zionism and be like, you know, but we like hummus, so it's all good, you know? So that's kind of the, you know, where we come at it, where we approach it from. But, you know, we're certainly not saying like, you know, this is where we draw the line and there's no, you know, absolutely we can't, you know, um, enjoy the food together or whatever, you know, but it's more nuanced than that, you know, as you know, and, you know, and I think everyone recognizes food is in more than about just food. Um, and then speaking of Maqlouba, there was a piece in the Washington Post, I think a year or two ago with Verit Gutman, who's an Israeli food writer based in DC, where she wanted to interview me about the book. And, um, we actually quote her in the book in a piece on cultural appropriation because she had written something talking about Frika as being like this incredible new discovery by you know Israeli celebrity chefs. And it was like, the reason it was troubling is because they published similar articles in the Atlantic and the New York Times and then just scanning the article, it's like nowhere once did they mention, and by the way, this is something that Palestinians have been using or for, you know, along with like the rest of the Levant, you know? You know, the same way we talk about maize or whatever other vegetables and grains being used here and, and the First Nations and whatever. Um, so that's, and so she comes and interviews me, but she doesn't mention this. And after we, I made Ma'luba for her or whatever. And when the article came out, she started it by saying like, you know, sort of like, you know, I'll be honest. I was a little, you know, sort of pissed off because she wrote this thing about me in the book. And, you know, and I've been making Ma'luba all, this, all these years and I, you know, and you know, yes, she's originally uh, uh, a Jew of Iraqi origin, and she's like, but I just never thought about it from this perspective. And we sat down for two or three hours for me trying to explain it to her, and it was only when I sort of contextualized it sort of in this colonial um, mentality that she got it, you know? And then, and so she writes in that, I think now I'll begin to think in a more nuanced way about when, how I'm approaching this. And when I talk about Matluba being Israeli, you know, it never occurred to me before. So. The conversations are, are happening now, thank God, and the discourse is changing, I think, you know. To, you know. I'll try to make my responses briefer. Sorry, I feel like I'm spending an hour responding to everyone. No, thank you. Um, <laughs> so for those of us who aren't experts in Palestinian cuisine, can you talk a little bit more about the uniqueness? Yeah, of yeah, definitely, because I haven't even talked about that. You're yeah, right. and I kept seeing photos and... Yeah, oops, sorry, I'm trying to find... Um, th this is, by the way, an example of the... The, the, the field work conditions under which we were operating is that Gaza only has, like right now, three hours of electricity a day. So sometimes we would be in the middle of trying to take a, a picture of something. In this case, it was a very rare variety of heirloom sour plum that as a result of the massive land raising on the border areas, these trees have largely disappeared. And, you know, this is sort of like a prize gift of any Palestinian from Gaza in diaspora is you ask for a jar of arasia jam. And so we happened to be there in season and we like through a network of clandestine network of, you know, farmers and merchants in the, we got like two, uh, two pounds of this and we're boiling it down. And then like the electricity went out and we were like, no, what do we do? And so anyway, this is, you know, me trying to photograph Maggie trying to take the picture of the jam. But um, so basically, I don't even think I have, you know, I was trying to see if I had some of the but basically, um, Palestinian cuisine is, you know, you can divide it, I would say, roughly into three categories. You have, like, the cuisine of the north, um, parts that, of historic Palestine that are now modern-day Israel that make up, like, the Galilee and that region. So um, let me see if I have it on the map I can show you. And that shares a lot in common with the neighboring areas, like Lebanon, the rest of the Levant, Lebanon, Syria. Um, so a lot of those dishes you have in common. Because remember, this entire region was once right under the Ottoman um, Empire, so that the whole region that was formerly the Ottoman Empire has a lot in common. You know, you'll find a lot of the same dishes in Turkey and, and Palestine and, and so on. Um, and then, um, so in the north, it shares a lot with Lebanon and, Syri and Syria, um, but it tends to be like yogurt based stews and dishes, um, almost no spices in northern Palestinian cuisine. Um, uh, a lot of grains are used as you, especially as you go inland to the farming, what we call the farming interior. Um, cook very seasonally, rely a lot on seasonal roots and vegetables and, and fruits. Um, and then um, as you go to the coastal areas, especially the urban centers like Yaffa, Haifa, and Gaza City, um, tend to have um, more um, richly spiced cuisine. And this is particularly the case in Gaza, where they're sort of um, famous for their uh, heavy use of um, hot peppers. And that's something that's really... So if I were to talk about the, the sort of... Um, 
defining characteristics of Gaza City cuisine specifically, it would be the chili pepper, the dill seed, and the dill, um, and the, generally the heavy use of spices. And that's something you really don't find anywhere else in Palestinian cuisine. And how the dill, especially dill seed, you know, you see it being used a lot in Iran, um, somewhat a little bit in Egypt, definitely a lot in Greece, and that may have been where, how that was absorbed, you know, when this area was open and um, it was the main port. But why it was absorbed only in Gaza, who knows? But they use a lot of dill in their cuisine, fresh dill and also dill seeds, which you don't really see being used anywhere else. A lot of chili peppers, like green chili peppers, is like a local variety, really hot chili pepper, um, sun-dried um, red peppers, and then it's ground into a paste also that you see you know, people, like that's talking about, someone was asking about malnutrition, and um, that's one of the most popular school time snacks, is like a red chili paste sandwich, and it's really high in vitamin C and other basic nutrients too, and it's, for poor people, that's one of the main um, staples. A um, lot of spices, so a dish of matluba that you might see upside down, like rice and vegetable casserole, that you will see being made all across this area. Um, in Gaza, would have like a multitude of spices that you wouldn't see uh, elsewhere. So it's just like very heavily spiced, sort of vibrant, um, a very um, lemony, so a lot of lemon and sort of sour flavors. Uh, uses a lot of pomegranate molasses, sour pomegranate juice as well. It's a different um, variety of pomegranate called, um, I had this sort of weird fascination um, and fixation with figuring out the exact names of these things. So my apologies, but it's like the white Babylonian pomegranate, actually. And um, it took me forever to find this out, but I was like, what is this, you know? It's a green colored pomegranate. Um, and I was like, I wasn't sure, I thought it was, it just hadn't ripened, but it turns out, no, it's a different variety. And um, what they do is they use it for juicing. So they press it for juice and it's extremely sour. And that, the juice of that sour um, green pomegranate is used um, to lend sourness to a lot of broths and stews that are, that are boiled and poured into like one bowl and eaten. This is really popular in Gaza too. Um, there's a range of these dishes. Rumaniya, um, which is also consumed in, in Yaffa, is a Lenten dish of lentils, pomegranate, and sour pomegranate, and uh, sorry, lentils, eggplant, and sour pomegranate juice that um, is very popular in this area. Um, there's and one other really interesting ingredient that you only find in this area is red tahini. So you've heard of tahini or sesame seed paste. So in Gaza, there's a different variety where they actually roast the sesame seeds and it like lends it a sort of a brick colored hue um, and really intense flavor. And you can't really find this anywhere else. And then again, I don't know why um, just in Gaza, but you know, it's gone because of obviously now the geographic isolation. You have a sort of a very interesting gastronomic isolation as well. Um, but those are the flavors are just much more pronounced and intense in Gaza. But then again, it shares a lot in common generally with Palestinian. Are there any spices that we wouldn't recognize here? I mean, the sp no. I mean, if you're familiar with Middle Eastern spice, the only one that's that people have a hard time finding, not because it's not available, just because it's not common, is the dill seed. Um, people are always saying to me, like, Wait, where do you? I just get it online, but you can. Sometimes Trader Joe's has it, but yeah, I, that's the only one that, even other Palestinians are like, what, dill seed? You know, they don't even know. There's a lot of dishes that are completely um, unknown to other Palestinians. And I've heard that again and again from them reading this book, like, what is this? We didn't even know that <laughs> you make these kinds of things. So that would be the only one. But the other spices are very common across, I would say, um, you know, all the countries, you know, from the rest of the Middle East to South Asia. But um, uh, cardamom, allspice is the main one. Um, allspice, cumin, cardamom, cloves. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what else. Yeah, dill and uh, cinnamon. Turmeric is used a lot as well in Gaza. Yeah. I don't know if it, yeah. So um, this is perhaps a little uh, foolish after <laughs> delicious uh, topics because nothing that we could offer people is going to be the description that we just heard. Um, but I did want to just mention that we have a reception downstairs with some light uh, refreshment and, and, and food. I wish I could say that it had white Babylonian pomegranate. You heard it here first, Obed. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe it's on your next visit. <laughs> but yeah. Please, uh, it grows in coastal sandy soils, by the way. So thus Babylon. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is Duke University.